and they were there. The island was smaller than they'd expected, only six miles long and half a mile wide, in the shape of an incomplete ring. The Americans had pulled out just after the end of World War II, but the channel they bombed through the surrounding coral was still there, somewhere. They spent a while looking for it before they could safely take the 120-foot catch into the protective lagoon. But once there, they were all alone. Breakfast on this uninhabited island is fish, but what a variety. Albie and John couldn't put a name to most of what was being caught, but what's in a name if the taste is good? The boys have become quite proficient at using the Hawaiian sling-type fishing spear by now, and just as well. They encountered this sharp-toothed creature of the deep, the savage moray eel, under the keel of the Clarabog as she lay at anchor. After exploring, the crew realized what a gold mine they'd struck on Palmyra. After exploring, the crew realized what a gold mine they'd struck on Palmyra. The army, in their haste to leave after victory was declared in the Pacific, left behind jeeps, trucks, machinery, now worth a fortune. John got a jeep and one of the trucks working by taking the parts from a number of vehicles and putting them in where needed. We had to improvise with a rubbish tin for a radiator. Once the trucks were mobile, we set off looking for material we could salvage and sell later on the trip. Miles and miles of copper wire, three tons to be exact, some covered with rubber insulation which had to be burnt off. brass hinges, window frames, wall fittings. Four tons in all. We all loaded it on board and sold it in Hong Kong three months later for a tidy sum. We soon settled into a routine. The women did the cooking, cleaning and washing and the boys went out to play. Exploring by day, we found a concrete dome overgrown by jungle that seemed as big as a football field. It was crammed full of everything, from brand new washing machines to a grader and jeep. A huge packages, never opened, which turned out to be tents which slept 400 soldiers. But perhaps the luckiest find was a huge General Motors diesel engine, 150 horsepower, big enough to push the ship along at a good six knots. That was fitted into the Clarabog in Hong Kong petrol was no problem. They found hundreds of 44-gallon drums of petrol hidden in a concrete bunker on the side of a hill, left there untouched since the war. And luxury of luxuries, a bathtub. And, as they say, if your best friend won't tell you, who will? The problem now was loading it all onto the ship. The original wharf had rotted away, so they had to make their own out of coconut palms. With everyone pitching in, it took only a day. that makes for a hearty appetite. The stores on board the ship were getting low, so the crew lived completely off what the island had to offer. And it offered quite a menu. Wild game birds, tasting something like duck, 
and crabs. We'd all split up in pairs by then and gone to different places to live. One guy and his girl lived in an old ruin of a barracks building. John and a friend roamed all over the place and slept under the nearest palm tree each night. Everywhere, crabs, some measuring up to three feet across from claw to claw, which made the crew sometimes wonder who was going to eat whom for breakfast. They were boiled up there and then on the beach and eaten with a swig of fresh coconut juice and, what's more, they had no dishes to wash. I built a hut of palm leaves for my lady friend on the highest headland overlooking the most magnificent beach I could find. The house wasn't much, but the view was superb. After about a month of that lazy lifestyle, they decided it was time to move on again. Palmyra had been an idyllic and profitable stopover, but the skipper was getting restless. So they upped anchor and set course for the Gilbert Islands, a month sailing away.